Appreciate you being here with us today, folks. We're right at uh, 1 p.m. I wanna keep us all moving. Uh, hopefully you're all seeing my screen. You should see the slide that says qualifying and assigning high impact um, uh, practices attributes to courses. And it looks like we have a good number of our participants. Uh, with this presentation is being recorded. So if other members of your teams or, um, um, uh, or folks that you would really like to share this with uh, need to see it, uh, usually by the time I render it and get it up on the, onto our YouTube channel, uh, I typically will do that on Monday. Um, so we'll, you'll expect to see a link up here uh, letting you know where to find that. That will be on our Complete College Georgia YouTube uh, pages, uh, which you can find just by searching, but I'll get you the link also, because we have quite a number of videos there. Um, so today, I am going to uh, begin telling us, uh, you a little bit about how we are currently looking at qualifying and assigning high impact practice attributes to courses. I want to stress that today, we want more than anything for this to be a conversation. This is, is a presentation. And uh, my colleague and, and partner and, uh, and all of this work, uh, Dr. Bruce Van Dahl is going to be co-presenting as he has in previous workshops here. Um, but, uh, uh, but in addition to that, we're going to leave a lot of time for questions and we really hope for this to turn into a conversation so that we can all just discuss how we're doing this and how we move forward. Uh, before I say another word, I wanna point out that this, uh, this workshop is a little different than the series we've had ongoing, um, the service learning workshop, which was recent. And then next week, we hope you can join us 10 a.m. on Friday, uh, April 23rd for work-based learning. Those are the workshops that our partners, our collaborators, Leap State Georgia, have worked to uh, pull together so that we can share promising practices all together on some of the most critical HIPs. These are all HIPs that, uh, as we did our, our, um, our, our survey not so long ago, uh, all of you responded and said, these are the ones we want to hear about the most. And so therefore that's why we focused on these this uh, semester. So we'll return back to, to that course of um, Leap State Georgia uh, backed um, uh, workshops on promising practices. Today, we're going to talk about something though, that I think is really important and, and that, that all of you have been thinking about a good deal since we first uh, started our HIPS implementation faculty. Part of the invitation letter for that, that, that went out last fall, you, you probably remember said um, that, that we were going to focus on qualifying HIPS in a way that's uh, hopefully more consistent and also uh, how to track them so that we know what we're doing from year to year so that we can make arguments for um, uh, how we can uh, seek um, external funding to, to work with HIPS in new and exciting and in interesting ways that lead to equity and follow our momentum approach and our momentum planning. Uh, and uh, uh, we all of that was in that initial um, that initial invitation. So I know many, many of you have been thinking, okay, when are we going to get to the point where we talk a little more about it? We, we have spoken and, and, and we've, uh, we've indicated where we're going with some of these um, uh, taxonomies and the HIPS attributes that are, are uh, live in Banner, the Banner information system for, for student data now. But today we're gonna to do a deeper dive into that. Um, I say a deeper dive, but it's not the only one because this will be an ongoing conversation as we figure out how this can best be done on each of your campuses because 26, 26 institutions, you're all different and you're starting in different places in this. Some of you have spent years working on qualifying and assigning HIPS and, and working with the banner system and others um, are really just cranking up to do that. So uh, with that being said, and understanding this is a beginning in a conversation, let's get to it. Assuming I can get my um, slides to begin working. So here's what we really want to do today. Uh, oh, and, and a little housekeeping before I forget. Uh, if you have questions that you think can go into the chat, please put them into the chat and we'll get 
get to those as we move along and especially uh, during the last half of this presentation time. If you have something that's just really burning and you need to speak now, then raise your hand and, and do so and, and we'll be happy to put it, make a quick stop and, and answer that. I um, think I've gotten through enough of that housekeeping, so let's talk about our objectives. We want to review the system and initiative goals uh, for increasing equitable access and participation in HIP. So a little bit more review on that. We've done a good deal of that in previous workshops in November and January, but there are, um, there are goals for the system. And when I say initiative, I mean momentum approach uh, for increasing participation in HIPs. Um, we want to present a bit of the framework for identifying and qualifying courses that meet your institution's criteria for a high impact practice. And you'll note there that we're saying again, what, what we, we have from the beginning, we're going to stick to it, that it's your institution's criteria and definitions that are important. We, um, we hope that the HIPS implementation faculty teams all together, uh, working with uh, the USG, we all come to very uh, consistent um, uh, determinations for what is and what is not a hit. But we also recognize and honor the fact that your institutions are all different. You have different cultures and you have different, uh, different goals for your students in some cases. So there will be slight differences in some cases of, uh, of, of what you have decided are those most important elements or practices. I anticipate those really to be more a matter of, of emphasis though, and I think that we will end up with very consistent um, definitions for uh, criteria, uh, which is maybe some different emphasis depending on what your institution uh, focuses on as, uh, as critical. Uh, we wanna introduce some resources and tools for developing or revising your institution's process for identifying, qualifying, and attributing courses that are implementing HIPs in the banner system. So uh, when I say resources and tools, work that we've come up with here um, during our time, beginning in 2018 in particular, when we uh, received the uh, NASH, National Association of System Heads project to begin focusing more fully on um, uh, equitable and um, scalable HIPs across the state. Um, some of those tools that began development in that time, such as our taxonomies. Also though, uh, again, this is gonna be a shared effort because some of you have already worked on taxonomies uh, and I would like to, as we move along, to find ways to harmonize those. Uh, and I think we will find ways to make that work. And uh, in terms of attributing courses that are implementing HIPS and Banner system, have some uh, really interesting and exciting information, I think, on a course attribute dashboard that our uh, good friends, our uh, information technology and Georgia best friends are working hard to complete for us to make this easier for everyone. Also then wanna provide some guidance for incorporating HIPS into your institution's momentum plan. Uh, the momentum updates have been coming in recently. We wanna thank you very much for those. You've been sending those to Jonathan Hall here at the USG. And um, you know he's collate, he's collecting all of those. We're reading them. We're uh, we're definitely paying a lot of attention to what your your updates are for your plans. And very happy to see, uh, as I've skimmed the the ones coming in now, uh, the the emphasis on high impact practices that I that I'm seeing there. Uh, but we want to talk a bit about how to do that in a way that that uh, is consistent with your institution and and, and works for you. Uh, as well as working for the USG. And also I'm going to say a bit about um, the uh, final uh, report that, and that sounds awful when I say report, but really it, it's not an assignment. It's really more of a reflection. The final report that we're asking for our um, HIPS implementation faculty in May, which is, is really a set of questions about where you find yourself now um, and what the scope and, and, and length of that will be. Uh, the gist is we're going to make that as non-burdensome as possible because like your momentum updates, uh, it's better to make them pithy and, and to the point. All right. So to give uh, a little more idea again, you've seen this in the past. We, we talked about this as we introduced the project and the initiative, um, but part of the, 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 the impetus behind all this work is that we have an objective at the USG to expand equitable access. And by that, I mean access to all students um, so that high impact practices aren't just focusing on those students who have 
more resources to say travel or more resources to to add on to their schedules while they're doing a lot of uh, of, of heavy work to be able to pay for their for for, for their uh, educations or due to ethnicity or 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 uh, it, you know for uh, race ethnicity uh, where we see that there are some cases where students have um, uh, different uh, differential success so far in some of our momentum goals. And we, we want to make sure that we find a way to see what's causing those and to, to address them. So part of that is with high impact practices along with all of our other momentum initiatives. So uh, equitable access and um, experiential learning opportunities for students. And, and one uh, of the, the foci for experiential learning comes from the USG um, uh, strategic plan, which has been, we've been tasked with uh, increasing student enrollments and experiential learning uh, from a number of 42,129 in FY 2019 to 150,000 in FY 2024. And uh, I think we've talked already a bit about how experiential learning certainly fits very closely with many of our high impact practice uh, current uh, work and our goals. That's just one of the goals. Uh, but in addition to that, as always with the momentum approach, we want to make sure that every student's getting the best education possible. And by that, it, emphasis on every student. So um, in some cases that will be ex experiential learning that uh, will appeal more to the, the goals of those students and will need uh, perhaps some promising practices to help expand equity for them. So our goals here specifically uh, maybe could be boiled out to planning and implementation of HIPs that can serve as new models for in-person blended and or online learning. You all know we've come back to, uh, you're very aware to in-person learning and so our emphasis is really there. But we aren't uh, ruling out blended and online learning too, which is always an important part of our long-term goals here at the USG. Identifying the current campus methods for reporting HIPS attributes and course sections. That's what I meant by saying that um, uh, it, it, the, the final uh, goal deliverable report that we wanna ask from you is really a, an addendum to your momentum update that your campus has given that uh, answers some questions, discusses where you find yourself currently on your campus or in your institution on reporting attributes for HIPS. Um, and, and we'll get into a bit more about the importance of, of that long-term. And we wanna facilitate a smooth transition to reporting in those course se sections that possess attributes in the banner information system. Um, we have a strong understanding and, and I think empathy for the fact that you as, uh, as faculty members uh, may be very much divorced from um, what happens in that banner system in the end. You know, you, you'll report on what you're doing in your courses, your, your, your focus is on educating your students. And in some cases, uh, it, it may seem like that's a couple of steps away from what you normally do. So we wanna make a, a, good, a smooth transition and connect the dots between what say may happen in the registrar's office uh, for that reporting, what might go through your department heads, and what you're doing and your focus, which again, uh, you know, is rightly, of course, the education of your students and, and probably is not quite so much focused on um, those long-term attributes uh, at this point. And, and it would be helpful for us to find a way to show what that process could look like. Oh, it's underlining. There we go. I want to thank, um, as we get ready to do this before anything else, uh, I mentioned we're going to, to have a course attribute dashboard that will be rolled out um, later this year that is going to assist in that last point, connecting those dots between faculty and uh, department heads and, or heads in colleges and registrar's offices. And uh, we have a, a wonderful team at Georgia Best that is helping us do this. So I wanna say they're a key partner. I want you to know who they are in case we, you know, we refer to them frequently. They work on application development and support for the state, manage services, distance education services, and a lot more. And, and in many cases, what they do is to try to make work easier so that you can do your jobs more easily and that we at the system office can do that too. We have a few folks here today from Georgia Best and 
Uh, maybe they'll get a chance to say hello later on in our presentation. But these are the folks who are um, helping us with the, the business side and the technical side and the, uh, the nuts and bolts side of how this can be made easier as we move forward. All right. So another key goal for us is encouraging expansion in HIPS offerings without compromising quality. When we've said equitable, I have had a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, well, you know, you say equitable, but uh, does that mean that necessarily there, there must be a change in the quality? We definitely do not want a change in quality. Uh, a couple of um, specifics that I, I've given to individuals who've asked that question have been um, quality remaining the same or higher, which is what our real goal is, expanding and increasing quality of our hips, incre increasing um, uh, you know, how, how we understand they're having a real impact on that student and those students' goals in life. Um, the equity part of this, like any other part of equity, whether it's in co-requisite remediation or in guided pathways or in any other, any other um, uh, way that we focused on, uh, during the momentum year and the momentum approach going forward, is simply to understand how that can impact everyone and doesn't just differentially uh, assist students of certain types. So definitely no compromise in quality. Um, this is one where I would like to, uh, actually, if, if you're willing, Bruce, uh, our partner here, uh, Bruce Van Dahl, to give a little bit of information on, um, on what that high access and low quality uh, uh, paradigm really looks like, because it seems like it's a little bit of a tension between the two. Uh, in truth, I think that they really are not in tension, but they can uh, they can work together. Bruce, just let me know if you're able to speak a few words. To yeah, them. sure, Robert. Happy to jump in. I think um, sort of if you think about this key consideration, uh, as we've looked at other implementations of various initiatives, whether that's uh, at other in, in other systems that have implemented and incorporated HIPS into their banner systems and have uh, had initiatives to expand access to HIPS. Um, you can imagine a scenario where either you create a, a sort of a whole slew of, of courses identified as HIPS, but without a clear criteria of what the HIPS are. And so you find yourself on the back end trying to decipher which courses actually do meet a standard of quality when it relates to HIPS and which ones do not. And sometimes that can be problematic in terms of actually seeing and ensuring that you have a, 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 a system with integrity and truly does ensure access to quality HIPS. Uh, on the other hand, you could create a system and a process that's so rigorous, so difficult, so focused that suddenly you, you, you turn off the spigot and um, few people are interested and are, have the time and capacity to build out a structure in the course. So the key challenge for us is how do we find that balance point where we're definitely committed to access, but we're doing so in a manner that is going to ensure uh, that those experiences um, are somewhat equitable, both in terms of the quality of the experience and also access to the experience, right? So here, we're gonna go through a couple of slides that help maybe illustrate some examples of how, you might, how people might design a system, right? Uh, so for example, a system that might have high access and, but low quality would be one where you sort of put an all call and a commitment across campus to say, we wanna see dramatic improvements in the number of HIPs across the campus in all departments simultaneously um, and that we're going to try to encourage you to implement all of the HIPs. So we know that the a a ACNU has those 11 HIPs, that's a lot. And so suddenly it could easily become sort of this massive effort um, and you could see many people identify the fact that they're implementing HIPs, but on the flip side, if you don't provide clear definition of what those HIPs are, um, you, lack, uh, you don't provide guidance to faculty on how they can guide, how they can implement those HIPs and design those HIPs. If you don't spend a lot of time reviewing those course offerings to ensure that they do meet some sort of a minimum standard, you can have all these opportunities out there, but no consistency in terms of the quality of the experience from one uh, course offering to the other. So that's sort of one extreme example. Let me go to the next slide, uh, Robert. Um, you can look at another example which is maybe we, we, we want to make sure we put a lockdown on what the quality looks like, uh, but we limit uh, the number of HIPs that we're focused on to a very finite few. We limit uh, the number of colleges or departments that are doing it. Um, and 
um, and we limit the number of hips that we're tracking. So maybe we decide we're only going to focus on undergraduate research. And that's definitely within your prerogative, but you might be, as a result of that, limiting the number of offerings and availability of hips within your institution. And then similarly, you might create really high bars in terms of what a HIP is. Um, you might create a very high bar on who, which faculty are allowed or are, are, are credentialed or um, certified to offer HIPs. Mm -hmm. And the process might be overwhelming, you know, multiple proposal steps and presentations and approvals that are a huge disincentive for a faculty member to go through the work. And so that's sort of the other side of the spectrum. I'm guessing that no institution would probably do either of those, but it's sort of to provide us sort of a, a, a sort of a band and a continuum of what might happen on your campus. And the question is, of course, finding that sweet spot in terms of access and quality that works uh, for your institution. So that's just sort of in general what we're talking about. So Robert, so um, I'll pause there and see, Robert, if you wanna jump in in terms of sort of maybe some guideposts uh, for, uh, for how you might go ahead and set those standards for your institution, own institution. So uh, thank you, Bruce, I appreciate it. That, uh, that was really helpful. The, um, as you can see, that was the sort of the extreme example of, and, and we want to include those because we have 26 institutions and we have a lot of differences. But on the other hand, as I said, I expect that as we move forward um, this year and the following year with HIPS implementation uh, at scale, we're going to find ways to make those very, to harmonize them, make them very much uh, uh, more consistent but it's good to know what those, uh, what those extremes can be, certainly. Um, some ways to, to uh, from working with, with schools here in Georgia and also a lot of data from schools outside of the state to AAC and U data and related uh, work from, from Q and others that, that many of you probably know. Uh, some of the ways to do this are to set manageable and incremental goals in increasing HIPS offerings. We're going to say a little bit in a, in a soon about what some of those incremental ones could be, but the, the point is manageable and incremental because we're not expecting uh, a sea change in the, in the space of one semester for HIPS. We have too much going on. There are too many uh, extraordinarily powerful momentum approach uh, sets of work going on throughout the state. Uh, and we don't want any of those to suffer for this, but uh, with your time. But we also do know that we need to keep moving and uh, manageable and incremental goals will make that happen. But uh, you know, a focus on that, we want everyone to remember, we are looking at those that are manageable and are step-by-step. -step. Um, clear and rigorous, but achievable definitions of high impact practices. Uh, that's why I said that you, you may have some different emphases on what your specific high impact practices in your institution, because, for example, one of them might be required at your institution and in another institution, it may not be a required course. So there might be a little bit of a difference in the focus and, um, and emphasis there. On the other hand, we expect the actual definitions of what is or is not a practice of that type to be pretty similar in the end so that we can actually use data and learn something uh, that, that's uh, productive from that data, uh, both from the institution and statewide. Appropriate guidance to faculty on designing courses consistent with HIPS definitions that is substantive but not burdensome. And that's part of the reason why you've seen and will see the, uh, the, the further workshops that, are, that we're doing with our partners, Leap State Georgia, that are, are helping, understand, helping us understand what are some promising ways to look at, say, uh, work-based learning, service learning, and, and the other topics that they're focusing on, ones that you've chosen as really important uh, through, through your own responses. Um, and, and that guidance is, is, again, just beginning. These, these workshops are here to give you promising practices. But in the end, we realize that all of you here are going to contribute to that. What are those practices uh, that are best? And, uh, and what are some of the problems that you're having that maybe you're shared by other schools? Um, part of what we're doing moving forward is also looking at new communication tools so that you can speak together and in a productive way 
and with the USG and with our partners, um, you know, both here and outside the state that are, that are experts on the subject, but most definitely yourselves and, and the work that uh, you're doing and the, the great deal of experience that you're, you're accumulating in knowledge. Uh, a process to review and qualify courses as HIPS that is as rigorous, but not overly bureaucratic. A little bit, we'll, we'll say some about that in some slides in a bit, but also that's where this course attribute dashboard, I think may be a help as we move forward into the fall semester. Um, and a protocol to assign HIPS attributes to courses in Banner that's consistent, efficient, and sustainable. Again, um, that, that dashboard I think will be a help to us. Uh, in the long run, the institutions will have to agree on a uh, protocol but that's not gonna be done in a vacuum. You, you already heard uh, those who were able to, to be with us say on March 3rd, um, and we have a recording of this uh, presentation on high impact practices as part of our Momentum Summit 4. You already heard some examples, and these were from, um, uh, for example, from uh, Georgia College and from Kennesaw State University, uh, a couple of ways that uh, two of the institutions have moved forward with protocols to do this. There's certainly a lot more detail that can be given both from those schools who've done excellent work and other schools here that haven't yet had a chance to speak. And uh, some may have a combination of very, uh, probably not extremely, but, but somewhat different approaches of protocols. Um, so we think that there will be a uh, something like a, maybe a menu of, of protocols, or maybe it's, it's a, a different set of recipes, the way, um, you know, Dr. Dinley speaks about the brownie, or I think now he's using something more healthy, like a fruit salad for momentum. Uh, but there, there will be different ways, different recipes for making it happen for you. So uh, this, this is a, a slide that I, I want you to, to look very carefully at the words that say, um, um, example approach. Um, example approach because that's exactly what this is. Uh, we are uh, working through this process with you and understanding what works uh, with each of the institutions and with the USG goals. And uh, we are uh, simply writing one way on this slide that uh, the, the approach might go forward, forward in this year and following. Um, so in that case, we're looking this year for certain at identifying, qualifying, and assigning HIPS attributes in manner for courses uh, for folks already implementing. And, and, and some of you are doing undergraduate research, service learning, and work-based learning. There may be others that you plug in there as opposed to those three. But we understand that in year one, you're not going to necessarily be able to cover every HIP. You may not be working on every high-impact practice on your campus. So as one example that we have received from several of you, uh, these were three that, uh, that, that were a focus. So it may be that in year one, you are working and uh, focusing on qualifying courses in these very important HIPs. And again, that list may change depending on your school. That's not written in stone. Um, in year two, as we begin this work back in fall of later this year, um, one possibility is working with five, could be a different number, academic departments with limited offerings to develop, implement, and assign attribute for their highest priority HIPs to courses in those departments. That would be an expansion outward from the work in year one, but hopefully is manageable and is incremental. Um, but the point there is that you work outside, uh, move onward with other academic departments. Uh, could be other colleges, for example, as well. Again, this is an example. It's uh, simply a, um, an example approach, but that might fit your own goals as an incremental and manageable approach. Some of you may be already ahead of that, and you may have a very you may have something much larger that you can do. Uh, you know, it depends on the institution. And then in year three, this is a little harder to do because the crystal ball, the more years you get out, uh, gets a little cloudier. But in that case, it may be that we, uh, we look at uh, ensuring that all majors have courses offering at least one of the high priority HIPs. Uh, and those high priority HIPs may change according to your institution. They're not necessarily going to 
to be, um, well, they're definitely not going to be given by the USG, but they may, they're ones that are high priority for your institution. So that is an example approach uh, for incremental and manageable so that you understand, uh, if nothing else, that we're not looking to make a, a dramatic black, white, you know, um, up, down change instantly within the space of one year. Uh, I know there'll probably be some questions about that one and I and certainly honor that. So we'll, we'll definitely go back to that as we move forward today. Um, so what does this all really mean and how does it, um, how does it impact us and, and how, do we to, how do we do the work? So all of you, have, if you've been through our previous workshops, could not help but to have, have seen our focus on the AAC and U eight elements of high impact practices. We consider those key. I think every, uh, generally speaking, um, the leaders in, in the US consider those to be key for determining what is and what is not a high impact practice. So when you're making your definitions for what is and is not, these, um, I sent you copies of these with the invitation. I hope you receive them. If not, they're here linked with um, AAC and U. Maybe a little difficult to read this, Let's, but um, let me see if I can increase the size here just a bit for you. But we've talked about these and I wanna just go over them briefly so you remember that these are, these are important and critical, I think, for uh, determining in your own institution what is in it, what in it and what is not really high impact. Um, one of the issues we've had in the past um, to a, a greater or lesser extent is that faculty have wanted to do uh, high impact practices and wanted to uh, make sure their students receive something extra than, than you know, something experiential or something that gives them a chance to do reflection and, and to really change their, their ways of thinking, their, their, their life, uh, improve their life goals. Um, and these eight elements all, all apply to that. So I think that many of them will make sense to, you know, example of those are setting performance expectations at appropriately high levels, um, making a significant investment of time and effort by students over an extended period of time. That, that is a very common element of high impact practices. It's, it's difficult for students to do a short one-off kind of, uh, of assignment and still really have what you would call true high impact. Often interactions with faculty and peers about substantive matters. Uh, that might be working with a professor, working with someone in industry who has expertise in an area that the student really needs to focus upon. It could actually take a variety of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of real life um, experience. Um, experiences with diversity where students are exposed to and must contend with people and circumstances that differ from those with which they're familiar. Um, it's very easy for students to be in a bubble with folks who are just like themselves, especially if they're in a classroom where pretty much everyone is uh, very similar to them and their backgrounds and then their, their expectations and then their goals. And uh, it can be you know, quite an epiphany for students to see that there are different ways of approaching work out in the world and there are different ways that uh, other individuals with different experiences approach them. And, um, and they're unique challenges, especially understanding what those challenges uh, might be. Frequent, timely, and constructive feedback is, is often going to be one of those great, those most important elements. Um, it, without that, uh, you know, a, a HIP might not really be a HIP because the student could still be doing work in something of a vacuum, or they may not be receiving the kind of um, the contributions from, from uh, their leaders and mentors that can lead them onward to next steps and true growth. Um, periodic and structured opportunities to reflect and integrate learning. Integration, integration of learning is, is something that comes up constantly with high impact practices and structuring opportunities for that reflection and that integration is, is extraordinarily important. It's, it's actually, of all these elements, one that I see the most frequently. Um, allowing students to draw on material that's been covered and um, find some way to uh, to, to express what they've learned, to reflect on what they've learned, 
and, and to do it outside of the box of actually any kind of rote learning, but something they reflect on as a, um, as a change within themselves or a growth within themselves or an understanding that has expanded. Um, this is something you often see in capstone courses when students submit a portfolio and they explain the contributions of the artifacts that are in that portfolio and they talk about what it what it's done for them and uh, how it's maybe changed their approach or expanded their horizon. So uh, reflection and integration are probably two of the, the most important words, I think, for high impact practices when your institutions are are creating their their own uh, definitions for the each, for each one opportunities to discover the relevance of learning through real world applications that that really gets back to the experiential learning that we feel is very important experiential learning seems to have um, through the data a particularly powerful effect on students who have traditionally been underserved in some way um, it, it's it uh, the, the, the um, uh, data uh, seems to show that that um, can not only give them a way to explain to their communities, their families, how important this education is, but also a way to use it as they move forward from their school environment to work environment and make that critical jump to having some kind of experience that gets them their foot in the door. And, and, and there's much more than that because that, that's only, I'd say, the practical, the pragmatic side of it. There's also just the, the growth of, of students being able to, um, to um, do what we all know works pedagogically, um, take, take information that you've learned, reflect upon it, and then use it in some way, which is often going to be, or almost always, far more powerful than simply uh, memorizing. Uh, public demonstrations of competence. And, and in this case, these are often oral pre pre presentations of classmates. Um, and uh, they're evaluated by faculty, sometimes by peers, and, and, but often it's not oral. Sometimes it's, uh, it's some kind of a narrative, some written narrative or a practicum, and it's the result of a field placement, which is a, um, something that may happen in experiential or work settings. So not necessarily every one of these elements will be there as key in your own hits that you're working on, but it's very likely that many of them will be. And this document is one that we are focusing on from the USG. And I think really most every one of our institutions is already doing so. Uh, and it's good for us to know that these should be part of that, um, part of that work. Um, let's see here. Let's go back. All right, all those windows in the way. Now, AAC and you, uh, you know about the high impact practices themselves in terms of their nomenclature because we've all worked on those. Sorry about that, folks. I had windows popping everywhere on my side. The um, high impact educational practices, we're looking at the 11, and we, as we've stated from the beginning, that are focused on by AAC and you. Won't spend time on this one, but I want to remind you that this exists here in our high impact educational uh, practices um, folder that I sent you along with this invitation. So those include first year experiences, learning communities, writing intensive. Uh, we've seen a lot of in information uh, in the past here on undergrad research in our workshops service learning, uh, which we just covered last week, and, um, and uh, uh, within these work-based learning, which is going to be focused upon next time around. Uh, so these are the 11 HIPs that, that uh, the nomenclature that we're using. I have not heard any of the institutions saying that they are looking at different HIPs than these. They all seem to be using the same, um, this, this, the same nomenclature and uh, uh, there are some slight differences. So for example, in some cases, it may be called work-based learning where here it is not. Um, also, we're looking at study uh, away and not just study abroad because we understand 
that students may not have the resources to go abroad, uh, but they may have the resources to do a study away that can give them similar growth and similar, um, um, uh, uh, similar experiences. So I won't spend a lot of time on those, but I did want to, to at least cover those briefly so that we understand that uh, uh, these are the, the foci um, as we try to define this and help institutions define what really are high impact practices going forward. Um, Bruce, here's another one where I thought maybe you might be interested in saying a few words. Um, as we uh, speak a little more specifically, in this case, on one particular high impact practice, work-based learning, um, if you'd like to say a few words about uh, the achievable, rigorous um, uh, definitions of what high impact practices might be. Sure, Robert. Um, so, uh, yeah, using the AAC and U definitions and also the categorization of the 11 high impact practices, the University System of Georgia worked closely with the institutions that were involved in the NASH TS3 project to pull those two documents together into a set of resources that could be used by each institution to establish their own definitions uh, for each of the high impact practices. So what we did and we shared, I believe that uh, to all of you um, initially as part of this, uh, uh, email, part of the invitation to this event are 11 documents that really uh, provide maybe a, a starting point or a jumping off point for your conversations at your institution to develop your own definitions of what a high impact practice is. And so essentially what we've done is we have 11 documents that have essentially merged the, uh, the, uh, the definitions of HIPS, the eight elements, as well as the specific characteristics of each of the 11 HIPS. You could cut and paste that and make that your definition. That we would be completely fine with that. Uh, but we also know, as we've seen from other presentations from our other workshops, that each institution might have refinements of those definitions. We know that in the research and the literature, there's varying definitions of, say, what service learning is. You're absolutely entitled to and encouraged to consider those other definitions for your own institution. But we wanted to at least provide a common denominator for each institution. For it, so in this case, you can see with work-based learning, if you want to click the others, uh, Robert, you'll see we've done similar for other uh, HIPs. Um, and so uh, those will have been shared with you. You can use those as a resource, but they're not intended to be prescriptive. They are a jumping off point for your own uh, conversations. In addition to that, um, in those documents, you'll find guidance on how you might then use those characteristics to design a process for identifying and then qualifying courses on your campus. So the idea and the suggestion is, is that you click create clear definitions um, and then to work a process with uh, your faculty and your departments then to determine how to identify and qualify courses that meet whatever definition you've established at your institution. But we want to, at the very minimum, provide you an easy uh, reference tool to share with um, your colleagues and to use as a starting point for your own conversations about what definitions you would like to um, uh, create for each of the HIPs you'll be focusing on as part of this work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bruce. Much appreciated. And to move forward on that a bit, uh, because we want to leave time for questions, Let's look at some possible ways that those course attributes could be added to Banner, uh, to the inf information uh, system. Um, so right now, this what you see in front of you is actually a, um, uh, a method that is used by many of the institutions here in Georgia and outside of Georgia, actually, uh, and nationally, where faculty submit their understanding of, of, of which attributes apply. So uh, I'll show you what a couple of those look like um, as after we, we go through this definition. And uh, the faculty uh, give those to the department chair. So the faculty may say, for example, um, on service learning, check, yes, this course meets our definition of service learning. We've examined it and I believe it does. Department chair reviews it approves it, sends it to the registrar. Registrar says, yeah, this looks fine. Then there is a process where that is entered into the banner and information students and information um, system. And then we can track it. We can use it for data from then on both institutions and the USG. Um, 
maybe the registrar says, or the department chair may, may send it back and say, oh, you know, I'm not sure about this. Can you give me more information? So that's why the arrows go both ways there. Um, or it could be the registrar goes, sends it back to the department chair and says, we, we need to review this because this is different than say the, the, the way we've done this in the past. These are different definitions. So this, however, is a flow chart for how it works on a, a number of our institutions currently. And it may be one that works very well for you, especially with uh, the addition of tools as we move forward in this process through this year and next year. Uh, but we've also seen that there are some schools that uh, at this point in time are doing something a little more truncated where the faculty are submitting information directly to the registrar or to the registrar's representative and the review goes back and forth there. Uh, registrars often won't have a lot of information to, to really know whether um, this course meets the definition or whether this course is meeting the definition or the attribute of so many contact hours, for example, or not, but they still may have questions. So that's why there is a review process that can go back and forth. But uh, in that case, the real difference is uh, the department or college head who's in the middle is not there and information goes directly to the registrar. Again, usually someone in the registrar's office is entering into the banner information system. Uh, even there, we've seen some differences where um, we have seen cases where I've been told that the um, uh, department heads are entering directly into the system. Uh, that doesn't seem to be so common though. It usually is a part of the registrar's work or their office's work. Um, so in terms of that review, with the, the real concerns are to clearly articulate the expectations of faculty and the elements to be included in a course submission. They need to know what those are and what is their job. Identify who um, will, will do submissions and when those submissions will be reviewed. It could be reviewed um, at the beginning of a semester. Some schools like to, um, to, to review and to enter those attributes at the beginning of the semester. Some are doing it later in the semester, for example. It, but it's a good idea to know what that's going to be and when so you don't have uh, confusion. Establishing clear guidelines and timelines for submissions and approval of courses, that's pretty much the same thing. You know, it, if, your, if your school wants to know, if your institution wants to know um, whether something receives um, attributes X, Y, or Z for a course at the beginning of the semester, it's important to know that. Otherwise, um, you know, it's going to cause confusion again. Uh, some schools won't, will not have, have that in place already at this time. Provide meaningful feedback to faculty if a course is not approved. Faculty need to know why it's not approved. Um, it could just be that uh, the department head, for example, doesn't know enough about it and needs a little more, a little more text, a little more detail, maybe a phone call to simply explain it. Uh, but in any case, the faculty really need to know. So that's why the, the, um, in, our, in our little graph there, the, um, the information goes both ways between uh, those who are reviewing and back to the faculty who are probably teaching the courses and know the courses better than anyone else. And establishing a timeline for reviewing a pre previously approved courses. What this means is you may have a course that's been approved. It was approved in 2018. Well, in 2020, do you just click yes, or do you just automatically approve it and grandfather it in? Or is there a process in which this course is reviewed again so that it can be seen that it has, it continues to meet the guidelines, continues to meet the definition, um, and or if it has a different instructor, those same high impact uh, um, processes are still, are still there in the course. As instructors change, for example, the course itself may change. So those timelines often aren't, they need not to be, they, they need to not be burdensome. It's very unlikely anyone wants to review every semester the entirety of their, their HIPS related uh, courses. It might be, however, once per year, or at the least once per two years, there's an automatic uh, review established to make certain that a course really still um, has those attributes. Um, 
So here is a process to review courses that, uh, that we, we are looking at that we, um, that we hope um, could, could be at least a basis for the work that you were doing so that you do not in any way try to do this on a white sheet of paper, a blank box. Um, in this case, for the review process, uh, for faculty, faculty uh, have been trained on design of HIPS, hopefully, that's something else we, we're dealing with in the, in the future. Uh, communication of criteria have occurred, what are the criteria, what is a HIP and what is not an appropriate uh, HIP here, and what attributes, um, what decides an attribute for yes or no, and providing clear and manageable applications for the faculty. They make a submission to say a chair or department head. Um, department head will review um, a rubric that will, will be developed through our process, our virtual process and achieve uh, a set achievable timeline to do this, provide feedback again to those faculty and submit the approved course with attributes identified. If not approved, send the feedback to the faculty, new submission, and at some point, it probably will be approved, could very well then go directly to the registrar's office and the registrar's office develop uh, mechanisms to code courses every semester. Reg the offices already know how to code courses, certainly. There may be ways to do it more simply, more effectively, and that's why we are uh, working on our course attribute dashboard as a tool to present in the near future. Uh, create time-based review. That's what I meant when I said that uh, approved courses maybe on a one-year basis, maybe on a two-year basis, everything is reviewed again so that uh, it stays fresh and we really understand whether a course is still the same course or whether it actually has more attributes or maybe has lost certain attributes that are no longer appropriate. And communicate to the faculty and chairs or department heads when the courses are ready for review. And then at that point, the office will um, uh, put the information into banner. I, I say code, but code is a spooky word to a lot of folks, but they will uh, enter that information into banner so that we will have uh, for all of us, USG, every institution, the ability to review and follow those courses ongoing. I see questions popping up, but we're gonna get to those, I promise. Um, so looking at that uh, banner course attributes dashboard that is in the works now that I've talked about, um, this is an example of how it might work for you. It does not have to work this way. Uh, it's a tool that will be uh, provided for you that our, our Georgia Best and our information technology teams are working on. But, the, uh, but one possible way it could be used um, is that it, it could mirror the approaches that we've just discussed. Faculty provide information to chair department head. There's a feedback to the faculty from them, either saying, give me more, explain, um, no, this is not what I consider to be a, an appropriate HIP. Um, I'll, I'll need to know more for it to be one. And then that department head or chair uh, approves sends to registrar's office. Registrar's office will review and give back to the chair if there's some uncertainty there, uh, ask for more information or, or, or um, uh, just clarification, but hopefully approval will come um, once that has been done and registrars will move forward with it. So that's how we're hoping that a dashboard that can be used by faculty, by chair and department heads, by all the folks in the registrar's office, a dashboard can be used so that all of that communication can take place within there so that it can be not only a way for, um, a, a, for record of uh, appropriate attributes for courses to, to be noted, but the review process can all also be captured and can flow back and forth between chairs, faculties, and registrars in a way that is uh, available on one dashboard and does not require a lot of different tools. Um, again, that's one way it can be used. Uh, we're gonna present this as a tool for the institutions, not a demand for them to use it in a specific way. Um, I wanna go back for just one moment here and I would like to um, actually do something just slightly different for a moment. 
because some people will have questions about those attributes and I want to show what these look like via our documents that we have shared with Georgia Best that are um, working documents for the uh, for our institutions. Here's an example of what the um, documents I sent all of these to you in the invitation. There are 11 of these, one for each of the high impact practices and you are welcome to pull those up and review them. But much of this information that is included here is standardized and it appears in all of the 11. Uh, so that's the important thing to know. You don't have an entirely new document with those 11s. There are only certain pieces that are really different. What is a high impact practice and guidelines for qualifying um, um, will be relatively similar. There are some things that are different though. And I'm gonna point these out specifically. On page one, there will be characteristics of whatever the high impact practice is. And the first of those characteristics in bullet points will often be different. So for example, for service learning, uh, field-based experiential learning with community partners will be one of those uh, likely characteristics. Direct experience with issues students are studying in the curriculum will likely be a part of it. Ongoing efforts to analyze and solve problems in the community may be a well, certainly in service learning are a very important part of qualifying as a high impact practice. Um, the rest of these, as we move down, often are relatively standard, which we've already discussed. And that will be the case on the 11 hits. So as you see in this document, it may look like a lot, but really towards the beginning of the characteristics, there's only a few specifics. Your definition will modify this information. This is what I would call the standard vanilla definition that uh, many AACMU entities and the USG are looking at as appropriate definition. Um, the other thing that really changes is different. You'll go forward a couple of pages and you'll see banner code categories. Even these are very similar and all of those 11 and they're very simple. Um, and I think a lot of concern um, a certain amount of worry for those who've never really seen these or, or, or been exposed to them can be alleviated by knowing that it's, it's actually very simple. So these codes, they'll appear differently depending on how your registrar's office in, uh, decides to set up their banner instance. But in general, um, and once we have our, uh, the dashboard uh, available, uh, essentially there will be a primary code. And that primary code will be, this, will be there for every hit. And essentially the primary code will say that the HIP, in this case, service learning, meets the institution's criteria as a high impact practice for service learning. That's where you look at the definition that's been decided on by your institution and is likely very similar to all other institutions and to USG. Um, in the case of service learning, these may be appropriate. They may not be, but we have codes, ZSL codes there uh, so that you can mark where appropriate, what are the, uh, the hours of service involved? Are they 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 50, 51 or more? As I say, again, in some cases, those are hard to determine, but better to provide the data you have than not provide data here because it, it really can be helpful to know if over 50 hours of service is involved, for example, as opposed to 10 hours of service in a service learning course. Uh, faculty should have some idea of what those, those, those hours are, even if, um, even if they have to estimate them a bit because of the complexity. And uh, this is one that uh, faculty asks us to add on to um, our 11 high impact practice attributes. And that's the required course code because some institutions have required courses. And it's required for all students to meet these and complete them. In this case, the course meets a high impact practice requirement established by the institution. So uh, that really is how simple it is. It's these are essentially one or zero check yes or don't check them uh, uh, attributes. And that's how it looks for service learning. If I show you here how it looks for work based learning, which is another one of those we are dealing with here in the short period of time, you'll see everything is pretty much standard, but a little bit of difference in the characteristics on page one, um, including 
um, those that you see here. And then when we look at the actual attributes, they're extremely similar. A code that says, yes, this does meet your institution's definition. In this case, again, we have provided uh, contact hours. In some cases that won't be appropriate, but in many it will be for you and it's useful to have the information. We receive these contract, contact hours by um, polling our own institutions at the time we were working on our NASH uh, project for high impact practices. And then again, there's that, yes, it is a required course or it's not a required course. So I know there's been some concern about um, how difficult this could be, but I hope looking at those, you can see these are really quite simple. And in the long run, um, the real issue is creating the processes for how you're going to uh, decide on the definition and just making that decision. Um, we've given a lot of guidance for what those uh, decision uh, attributes can be. And then also uh, working on a process within your own institution so that the information can flow and the, um, the feedback loops can work between all the parties involved. So here for our momentum plan appendix recommendations, this is something uh, I wanna give us some time for questions. Um, moving on to that, this is the, the final ask that we have for this semester for our HIPS implementation faculty. Um, we're looking uh, essentially for in, in May uh, for um, uh, receiving an addendum to appendix, an addendum to those momentum uh, updates that assesses the current process for entering course attributes and banner on your institution. You may not know every aspect of it, but your team hopefully has learned something about what that process is. It could be that at this point, your process is, is a legacy one and needs um, to, to have uh, a lot of attention, in which case that's perfectly fine. There's, we're just looking for where the baseline is here. We're not judging uh, where anyone is in this, we realize everyone's in a different place. We simply want to know what that is so that you can begin working with it and we can help in you working with that to move forward. Um, recommendations on year one goals. I mean, in this case, it could be, what is your prioritization of HIPS? Which ones, and we've asked this previously, which HIPS do you see as ones that are most important for you to dig into first so that you could do this in a manageable way? and not to get overwhelmed. Defining the scope, um, you know, at, at this point in time, are you looking more broadly or in select departments? We wanna know what that is at this point. You may be looking at select departments because you have so many offerings, or you may, um, uh, may be able to make a wider sweep of your institution. But again, that's where you are, not a demand from us for you to do an institution-wide sweep. And uh, looking at existing HIPs, um, accounting for what they are, finding out uh, to the best of your ability what those existing HIPs are on your campus that in particular may have high enrollment rates or be particularly important because they're required HIPs. And uh, we want some information on how you feel, you know, starting in year two, we could begin expanding those HIPs offerings. Um, Obviously, it's important to begin setting and reviewing criteria for qualifying courses, and that's what this entire presentation has really been about. Uh, we don't expect that that'll be finished. We really just want to know where you are with that. Um, are you in a process where you're pulling together a committee that's looking at what those review criteria can be for your most important HIPs? Developing or revising a process for qualifying them, same thing. Where are you with that? Um, do you, do you feel like uh, at this point you are um, already uh, using those key elements that we've discussed in, from AAC and you and finding a great many of those elements useful? Um, uh, are you just beginning to do that with many of the hips wherever you are, we simply want to know what that is. And uh, in some cases, this will be more, again, uh, is institution-wide. In some cases, it'll be really more what's going on in a very, in a, uh, a select portion of, of your uh, offerings that your team is able to, uh, to deal with at this time. And determining a process for entering HIPS attributes and banner, it is helpful to reflect, 
do you think at this time that say from those those uh, possibilities we showed earlier that uh, you already have one that is reflected there or do you have something different uh, and how are you looking um, in the future that you can determine that process if you don't have one you may not have the answer for precisely this is the way it'll be done but probably you'll have recommendations for what a next step moving toward that will be. So having done all that, I'd like to open things up for questions. And Bruce, I know you've been looking at those questions. Um, uh, and uh, we have a few minutes here to, to take them and, and to chat with each other. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, we've got a handful, but definitely want to encourage folks to dro drop some more in. We do have a fair amount of time for questions. So I'll just run through these, Robert, and see if you can answer them. Uh, the first question uh, has to do with the system goal, the board, uh, the board's goal around 150,000 uh, students enrolling and whether or not that's a semester by semester goal or an annual goal. My understanding of that, it's actually not really spelled out particularly well in the strategic plan, but my understanding is that would be uh, an annual goal, not necessarily um, not necessarily every year would have to be that, but that at 2024, we would have basically gotten to that level. Um, uh, and, and given the fact that we already had um, a, a number I showed you earlier, I, I'd have to look at it again. It was 40 something thousand, I believe. We already, we're already a part of the way there. Um, uh, but yeah, I believe that's, a, that's looking in 2024 for that year to show uh, 150,000. I think too, though, that the definition of experiential is relatively broad. Uh, and the strategic plan, it's it's not it's not delineated very finely. Um, so I think that uh, if you look at those those hits that we discussed earlier, as some of the more um, the ones that have popped up is as very critical uh, in our in our surveys from you. Um, I think many of those hits would count as experiential. So if we get uh, a more thorough um, if we get report of hips that perhaps have not been there in the past, I think we'll get closer to that goal. There's always a danger too when we look at attributes. We may find some things that are, that look like experiential and we find now they don't really fit the, the, the key elements. So it could go both ways, but I really believe that the more that we um, we expand our, our uh, coding, our, um, our uh, identifying of the attributes on hips, we're going to find that they're experiential elements there that, that perhaps we haven't seen before. So uh, follow up question uh, that was just posted. Is there a way to get a more granular um, analysis of that initial baseline? Um, and I'm not sure exactly what they're asking, but I can imagine which institutions, maybe which hips or which experiential opportunities are we talking about here so that people might have some idea of where we're starting from. There probably is, I don't have one right now. Um, uh, again, that, uh, for, for my own information, it's going primarily from the actual strategic plan, which you can read online and you'll see exactly where that information appears. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something that I think would be very helpful to discuss, you know, where we'll have a new chancellor also coming up soon. So that could always make some changes to, to strategic plans. Uh, but the board has agreed on these at this point in time. And I think that we, we certainly can find out a little bit more of, of what's really included there, what's intended. Um, I wanna say also with that goal, I, I, I didn't list that one to cause particular concern from folks, but really just to show where we're headed and that there is a board of regents interest, strong interest in making this happen as we move forward. Part of that is again, because data repeatedly shows that experiential learning uh, in particular seems to have a high impact on those students that have been underserved. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's, it's, it continues to be a very strong concern for us. So yes, uh, I don't, I can't answer that instantly now, but I uh, personally will be very willing to, to dig into that. Great. And it sounds like there's more questions about sort of getting that data. So maybe we can go back and talk about what is possible to be shared so that people can get some more information. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Rosa asking about sort of differentiating by type institution type or size. Yeah. Um, so there's all kinds of ways I think we could cut this. Is that right? Yeah. And one thing also to remember is that there has been absolutely there has not been 
any guidance saying that uh, institutions should have X number of experiential um, um, you know, courses that, that students have completed. It's not institution by institution. This was simply an aggregate for the entire state. So um, that's something I think that institutions that maybe don't have as many resources can, can relax on that point because it, it's not focused on specific quotas. Uh, much like when we were uh, beginning the momentum year, I had a lot of questions about uh, what portion of the changes coming up must we show in our institution? And I was able to come back and say, you don't have to do that because we're not looking at, that, at it that way at the moment. Uh, we're looking at scalable global changes, but not necessarily quotas in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, another question uh, has to do with um, the extent that the system has been interacting with provosts about this initiative. Uh, is this something that's a standing item, say at um, meetings with provosts? Or how have we communicated to date with provosts about the work? And the Always there can be more, more, but in the momentum approach, uh, as we went through Momentum Summit 4 and as we prepared for it, we increased our communication with provosts on the importance of high impact practices. Some of you who attended Momentum Summit 4 will remember uh, the comments that were made uh, about the importance in our updates that we're receiving now we are receiving updates on what institutions are doing for high impact practices in a very um, in a very brief sense. But the point is, it's become a part of the momentum approach. So therefore, provosts are seeing this repeatedly. Now the provosts are choosing team. Provosts chose our uh, provost office, offices chose uh, the folks here the, that are part of our high in, uh, high impact uh, faculty. Uh, and each one of them, I sent myself to the, the provost, the invitations to this with the goals spelled out. So that's, that was just one of the contexts. So always there can be more and we need to continue to close that loop so the provosts understand it's an ongoing part of the momentum approach. That's the critical part. But I think increasingly they do understand that. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so the next question is maybe a little bit more technical on Banner. Uh, Elizabeth was asking if a course has a high impact practices built into its approved course learning outcomes, is there a way in Banner for it to be permanently um, flat, all course sections, I presume she means, that have that are for that course be permanently flagged as uh, having high impact, having those attributes? I haven't thought about that. You know, we've talked about the review process and we've, we've noted that in some cases it may not be necessary to do the review often. Um, so permanent, I haven't so much thought of. What we have considered, uh, especially talking with our um, information technology and Georgia best partners, is that institutions could set that, re that, that, that review, that automatic review process where they want it. So it might be that you've set it very, a very wide period of time. Uh, so there will be flexibility for institutions to do that. If I may ask something, uh, Dr. Uh, Todd, um, we thought of this and we have came up to a consensus that um, an, a process could be uh, implemented through the course information management system that we have. Mm -hmm. And this goes through a review, not only by the chair, but also by the curriculum committee, which I think is a good place to review it. Is there a reason why this can not in integrate it into that system and have a separate system for, by itself? There's not a reason, and, and okay. if it's working for you, but, but you know, if you, if you looked at the, if you think about the uh, flow charts that we showed there, the, the real interest in the attribute dashboard has been that we had a request and it was an ongoing one from faculty to have a more effective communication process and feedback loop with department heads, heads chairs and registrars. Um, and so we're going to offer that as a tool. We're not going to offer that as a, um, a demand to be used. So there may be the fact, you may have something that is working really well for you now. And if that's the case, and, and all the parties involved are doing that, I'd love to know more about it. We'd all like to know more about it because actually we're all doing this together and figuring out what those promising practices are. 
Right. I mean, we've had some interactions, if I can jump in, Robert, with uh, yeah, institutional representatives. And we've seen different, we've talked through some different applications of the dashboard. It could be something that's sort of a last mile exercise, right? You have your own processes and procedures already established, and it's merely using the dashboard to enable or empower people to enter the data in. And you don't need uh, multiple checkpoints uh, or the checkpoints might be used for different purposes than the actual approval of the course. Others may want to use it as their entire process as a way to, to hardwire and structure your process for uh, uh, um, um, enabling faculty to submit courses for review. But the idea here is exactly as Robert mentioned is it's really a tool. It's not a required process at this point. Uh, next question. Um, uh, there is a question that's I think is um, maybe to the whole group. So I want to invite others to jump in, uh, whether or not there are institutions that have a sort of independent committee at the institution level or maybe college level that will review courses. So it's, I'm guessing not an, a, a, a department level, but a, a sort of a institution wide uh, level. Um, and so I don't know if others have, can share their own experience if they're doing anything like that. I know that we have, of course, heard from institutions that have more centralized and institution-wide objectives and goals and have built in HIPs into their program requirements at a uh, graduation level. So that might be the case, but um, Robert, I don't know if you had any examples that you know, but if you're from an institution that's doing this, feel free to share. I'd rather hear from others because I want to make sure that, that that everyone understands this is a conversation. We want to hear. We want to do this together. Mm -hmm. Great. There's I can I can chime on this one uh, since you know this relates to what I was saying earlier. That was one of the outcomes that we discussed uh, among the team in Georgia Southern is to try to find a streamlined process where we can review these. Um, as we do review our course objectives, learning objectives, and we do that through our curriculum committee where faculty within the department meet and discuss um, our syllabi and all of these things. I think this fits really well with this kind of work. And we thought if we incorporated it within that flow, uh, workflow, I think it would be a seamless inter, uh, in, uh, uh, embedding of this. And it doesn't, it won't be, as a tedious of a work that you know people will have to go do it extra and you know things can be um, evolving in a sense we don't require them to code it but whenever they up, upgrade or update or modify a course then they have to um, input the hips codes into kims and this will be uh, archived for the university and it would make it easier than having to do it on a continuous basis as well but that's like our you know two cents which we were proposing in our plan that we will be submitting, but uh, you know. Uh, no, I think that that's extremely interesting. And, and really, I encourage you to present that because that's something we will share with everyone. Uh, you know, once we finish this semester's workshops, we're not ending. Uh, we're going to pick this back up again in the fall and there will be a lot more to share. So love to get that from you. And, and maybe it could be the other institutions here find that to be really compelling. Yes, and I, we thought of also incorporating um, workshops, small workshop for introducing HIPS to faculty so they do understand what they mean. And I think going in, hand in hand, it will work well. Let's hope so, at least. And, and you know, some of our institutions here, some may be on, on board right now. I can't see the participant list at the moment, um, are doing those kinds of workshops. And they're already very much, um, they're set into the schedule so that they just happen. And that's, that's a good thing. Um, so uh, great, great comment. Um, uh, happy, looking forward to getting that information from you very much. Great, a couple more questions. I've got about 10 minutes left, so we wanna make sure we get through all of these. Uh, the next question has to do with the recommendations that we shared at the end of the PowerPoint for the appendix to the momentum plan. And I think people are a little confused if that's different from or the same as what we've already asked institutions to submit uh, to their momentum teams. Could you clarify same as, that, Robert? Definitely, definitely same as. That's not an extra ask. It, the wording might be slightly different on this, this, this um, uh, uh, 
slide. And uh, that's really just because we were wrapping up the entire workshop presentation here. But really it's the same. And I, I will send those questions, those base questions back out again to you. I think I've sent them to everybody to, to review. Uh, the ones that ask where you are now, uh, what do you see as your primary hips going forward? This is really just a restatement of that. And no, it's not different. We're asking for just that one document. One thing, I, I'm glad you asked that because you know the momentum updates themselves are, are a wonderfully uh, brief set of documents. Uh, Jonathan Hull did a great job of creating something that was easy to answer. And uh, there are only a few pages in those. So I wanna make it clear here, we're looking for pithy, um, direct responses. Uh, we're not looking for five plus pages on this. We're looking for something, you know, that, that's brief um, and uh, can be examined quickly. If it were, if it were bigger than that, then the appendix would be bigger than the actual update and report, right? We don't want that. And just so I want to, just again to, to clarify, so in terms of the bullets that people see on the screen here, based on what we've reviewed today, these are some suggestions of things that they might include in that communication. Exactly. Right. So, uh, you know, we shared, some, we shared some questions that that can be answered. And even those can be altered a bit because you may have something that is burning that you need to, uh, that you really feel is a, a best practice you need to share. Right. So they're not necessarily prescriptive again, that you have to submit these, but we suggest that you think about uh, engaging your momentum team about these points as part of that overall process, but it's, it's up to each institution. Yes. Um, okay, great. All right, so um, another question, another sort of in the weeds banner question is whether or not the, the codes that you've shared um, are, are already in banner. So people, if they wanted to go in now, could they start to um, uh, attribute these, uh, these uh, assign the attributes to the courses, their existing courses now? Yes, those changes were made at the end of last year so that they would be available for this semester. And they are there now. Uh, I wanna thank Lynn Miller of Georgia Best for helping me figure this out because I, it's hard for us to know what other people see when they look at instances of Banner, uh, unless you're, you have your own eyes set on it. It depends on how the, uh, the, the instance has been set up, what is immediately visible. If it has been set up banner so that uh, at your institution so that uh, these attributes can be you know selected and, and easily viewed, then they're that they are there. Um, if you find any any case where uh, where these newer attributes we've added, for example, the required course is not for some reason appearing, it's because the instance has been hasn't been set up to show that, but it can be. Uh, so yes, they are there. Um, it, in a few cases, it might be necessary to make sure that they are visible. Lynn, you, if you're listening right now, you're free to jump in here and correct me there if I'm wrong on anything, but I believe that's uh, the way it is working. Great. That's, that's accurate. Um, for the most part, uh, the attributes, I'm not positive. I believe Cindy and, and Jill are on the call with George Best. I, I don't know if those were auto-loaded, you guys, into the tables. Robert that are behind mm -hmm. the scenes, but in most instances, they are loaded through a script and folks already have them in banner and the registrar can see them. And I know some faculty at some institutions actually have access. Uh, to and that's what I've heard, which is why I was a bit confused myself because some faculty said yes and others weren't sure. Yeah, um, yeah, but that's right. Hi, Lynn, this is Jill. I'll add to that. Um, as a part of the academic data collection with Dr. Bell's group um, in reporting and policy analysis, um, those codes should be present in each institution's banner. They have been a part of the data collection for um, a couple of terms now, mm -hmm. so they should be present in each institution's banner. Thank you, Jill. I appreciate that. Um, always helpful to have those who know all the nuts and bolts of this to be able to help us um, to, to work our way through it. Great. Um, next question. Can institutions add additional codes uh, for their HIPs? In other words, add a greater definition or for whatever their own purposes might be um, yes. for the banner system? Yes, that's the easiest question all day. <laughs> 
because we already know that some institutions are already, already tracking hips in their own way mm -hmm. and we're not asking them to replace or eliminate that in any way shape or form maybe that's even no. more <laughs> clear. No, we're not no we're not and yes they may add attributes as they need now those may be not used by the usg in reports that we are um that you know that we are um um, compressing in some way to share with Complete College America or the Lumina Foundation or whatever, we may or may not use those, uh, but the institution is certainly welcome to use them in any way they need. Great. And we have Jordan from uh, Georgia College. Jordan definitely needs a moment here. He has a public service announcement for us. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan's offering a clarification though that the Z prefix is specifically for only system level codes. Yes. Is that right? Okay, but yes. you can create additional codes. Okay. Yes, and there can be additional codes created, but yes, that is correct. Yeah. Right. So the point is, is that we're there. The only data that you, at the system, is going to be collecting are those with the Z prefix. If I could be clear about that, um, you're not going to be collecting or tracking data that institutions might collect uh, through their own customized codes, right? That and they institutions, yes, code. institutions are free to add codes, but uh, but what we collect, maybe it will in this case be different. Okay. Hopefully that answers uh, C. Douglas's question. Any other questions? We have just a couple minutes left, so we can maybe squeeze one more in. Otherwise, uh, Robert, I don't know if you want to offer any closing. Um, I think we need, uh, I'd like to turn this over to Jordan Kofer for a moment. Jordan is um, the uh, president-elect for Leap State Georgia. And uh, a lot of the folks here have been um, get, getting a lot from Leap State Georgia, uh, learning a lot and exchanging a lot of information. And I think he has some information about uh, uh, Leap State uh, moving forward this year that he'd like to share with us before we, before we close. Oh, thanks, Robert. Uh, all, all I was gonna say, well, yeah, everybody, thanks for coming. Um, was that today is the last day to vote for officers uh, for uh, the executive board for Leap State Georgia. So we've had uh, a lot of people voting. I think it was like 60, well, last time I checked, it was 60 some votes. So um, if you're, you're interested, I'll put, I can put the link back in the chat. Um, I also emailed it out, um, I think last week. So otherwise, thanks a lot. Let me see if that, you know, if you want, Jordan, just put that back in the chat and um, we'll let that um, show here. Great. There you go. I think you've yes. got it in there down at the bottom. Okay. Um, I think we're right at just about a time here. Uh, I don't want to keep you over. Uh, if, if we have any other questions that were, uh, you know, extremely important to you, then um, the last slide included uh, uh, Bruce Van Dahl, his email and mine, you know, feel free, please email us, let us know what we can move forward on. That might also be helpful in us understanding what contacts we need to do in addition to our um, upcoming workshop next Friday, what we need to also help cover either at the end of this semester or immediately after this semester. So appreciate your help. All right. Well, I want to thank you all. I personally, this was a very important and uh, important workshop and one that I was looking forward to because we had, we had a lot of questions go back and forth with individuals all through the last semester. And, um, um, you know, uh, it's great to hear, us, hear your questions and for us to be able to tell you a little bit more and show you that it really isn't quite so intimidating to, to look at these uh, uh, selecting uh, attributes and code and coding or, or uh, presenting them. Uh, thanks to everybody who helped. Again, Denise Demisi for her help uh, in getting this to happen. To Bruce Van Dahl, thank you for, for uh, being the, the co-host. Uh, Leap State Georgia, uh, Georgia Best, thanks to all of you who asked questions. And I hope you can join us next, uh, next Friday at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, so that you can uh, you can hear the latest in promising practices. Thank you very much.